Well, good morning. Welcome to Crossbridge this weekend. It is a beautiful weekend to be together, and it's a great weekend to sign up for a group. And uh, small groups have been a part of my life since I was 14 years old. And uh, each group has served a different purpose. Uh, but I think I can say with absolute confidence, I wouldn't be here if it weren't for the community that I found in the group and uh, throughout the, all the groups I've been a part of. And so when we talk about small groups, it's about people. It's about finding a community that will support you and challenge you and be with you and live life together. And so just encourage you to check that out um, at the end of the service. Now, if you've heard me speak before, you know that I, I like to start by admitting things. And so I have an admission to make. Uh, seven weeks ago, my right eyelid began to twitch and it just twitches at random times, right? If you've ever had that happen, it's one of the most annoying things because you can't control it. You don't know when it's going to happen. So don't let that freak you out today. If my right eyelid begins to twitch. It's subtle, but my eye's like a foot on that screen, and so maybe you'll see it today. I actually Googled it. I, I think I'm okay. I haven't gone to the doctor or anything, so I, I turned to Google and uh, to see that, like, what causes eyes to twitch, right? And the first four things were this, stress, tiredness, eye strain, and caffeine. And now what's fascinating is seven weeks ago, things became a little more stressful I was a little more tired. My eyes were strained a little bit at night, and I consumed much more caffeine. We had our third child seven weeks ago. And so I brought a picture to, to show you today. Her name is uh, Sutton Grace Pickens. Yeah, that's her. She looks like her mama. And... Uh, she is lovable and cuddly, but man, I got to admit to you, she's a little bit of a tyrant. Um, she wakes up every three hours and she wants to be fed right then with grunts and screams and cries that wake up the whole house. And so, uh, but she's precious. We're glad that she's part of our family, even if it causes my right eye to twitch for the next however many years. So, well, well next week we begin a, a sermon series on First Peter. Uh, Pastor Kevin's going to be starting for that next week, uh, but this week we were kind of in between series, and so I, I went to Pastor Kevin, and I said, hey, Pastor Kevin, like, is there anything specific you think that I need to talk about, or, or what direction should I head? And he said, pick whatever you want to pick, and I thought, oh, that's dangerous, right? And so I thought about it, and I thought what God had been speaking to me about in my life, and so today I want to talk to you about failure. Yeah, you're like, what? Of all the things you could pick, John, failure, man, Debbie Downer up there, who let him preach, right? No offense to anybody named Debbie. Uh, so, but I, I, I pick this topic of failure because I think it's really important to us. Uh, because the reality is that we all fail in life, right? So sometimes they're big failures. Sometimes they're small failures. Uh, sometimes they're failures we look back and we laugh about later. And sometimes they're failures we look back and have some shame about. Uh, some of the failures that we look back on have really changed the course of our lives and others really don't have that much consequence over us. B but what, regardless, one of the things that is sure is that we all fail. And so I was thinking about failure and I felt uh, like I'm somewhat of an expert at failure. And so I thought I'd share a couple funny stories of failure with you to start off uh, this weekend. Uh, the first is when I was a youth pastor. And so uh, I was a youth pastor and a bunch of other youth pastors, uh, we all got together to put on a camp, right? So we're, we're all pitching in and volunteering. Yeah, you already see the problem, right? So anyways, Galen does a great job, by the way. He's very responsible. So anyways, a bunch of us youth pastors get together and we put on this camp for all of our youth groups and we go to this campground and we sign this contract and we say, yeah, we'll bring this many students and all this. And we go through the week of camp. It's great. And we get to the end of the week of camp and we set all the books and we're sitting down with the campground and that's when we realized we lost over twenty thousand dollars in one week of camp right they didn't invite me back the next year um that was an epic failure that had some consequences uh, another time i remember being in high school and failing in kind of communicating with a girl that i was really fond of and liked that was a frequent failure in my life in high school but uh, I remember this was one girl in particular. I really, really liked her, and I had the speech all prepared. You know, I was ready to go in there and say, you know, it's obvious, right, that I like you, and I think you like me too. And so, like, maybe we could hang out more, and, you know, who knows? And uh, so I prepare my speech, and I get up the guts to talk to her face-to-face because -face we didn't have text messaging in that day. And so 
I go to her, and, and, and I mean to say, you know, it's obvious I like you, and what comes out of my mouth is, it's obvious you like me. <laughs> and I stare at her with my eyes giant open, and she goes, okay. And I say, oh. I'll see you later, <laughs> and I jet it. I took off. Talk about failure, right? Now, she happened to marry me, so maybe there's something to that whole goofy, awkward guy thing, right? I don't know. But, but failure is a part of all of our lives, right? And some of them we can laugh about, and some of them we don't. And today, I, I really want to think about failure and our relationship with God. And, and I want to think about when we fail God, what does it look like to be restored with him? And so we're going to look at the life of Peter today. Now, if you're unfamiliar with Peter, Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples. He would be considered maybe even the leader of these 12 disciples of Jesus. Jesus was really fond of Peter. And in fact, he, he gave Peter this nickname, Rock, right? And so he called him, what's up, Rock? Like, that, that's pretty cool, right? And so he gave him this nickname, Rock, and he said, the future of my church is going to be built on you. And so Jesus is really fond of Peter and speaks some amazing words to Peter. But Peter failed in a rather large way. And the story goes like this, that the night that Jesus was betrayed, and he was taken to, to trial and he was interrogated, that Peter denied knowing Jesus three times. You see, Jesus goes into this courtyard, and, and they're, they're interrogating him, and Peter's following at a distance, so he won't be seen, right? And he's afraid that he's going to be arrested. And so Peter's on the edge of the courtyard, kind of trying to see what's going on over there with Jesus, trying to conceal his identity. And three different people at different times say, hey, like, you're one of that guy's followers, right? Like, you hung out with Jesus. He says, no, no. I said, no, 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 wait, 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 Weren't, don't you know that guy? He says, no, no, I don't know him. Now, Peter, I think you're one of his followers. Aren't, aren't you one of his followers? No, I don't even know that guy. And scripture says the third time that Peter denied knowing Jesus, that Jesus turned and looked at him. And scripture says that Peter was broken and just wept and ran out of the courtyard. And now we know the story that the next day, Jesus would die on the cross. Now, now just think for a minute about the shame that Peter felt in that moment. Can you imagine what was going through his mind? Uh, denying Jesus three times publicly and then knowing that he's now dead and there may never be another opportunity to make that up. My guess is that most of us do know that feeling. We actually know kind of the guilt that can come from that, the, the shame that can grow in our lives because of failing Jesus. And, and I'd even say some of us have begun to identify ourselves by our failure. We've taken on the identity of I am a failure. So much so that our very identity is wrapped up in our failures. And so today... I want to walk through the story in, in John 21 where Peter is restored. And the setting is that Jesus has been raised from the dead. He's actually seen the disciples a couple of times, but Peter and he, they haven't had that one-on-one, -on -one, and they haven't restored their relationship yet. And so I want you to listen closely as I read parts of John 21 to us this morning. The words will be on the screen. And it says this, Later, Jesus appeared to his disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon, Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. So they went out in the boat, but they caught nothing all night. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. He called out, fellows, have you caught any fish? No, they replied. Then he said, Thro throw your net on the other side of the boat and you'll get some. So they did. And they couldn't haul in the net because there were so many fish in it. Then the disciple Jesus loved said to Peter, it it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his tunic. He had stripped for work. So he jumped into the water and he headed to shore. Skipping down to verse 15, it says, After breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. And Jesus repeated the question, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Yes, Lord, Peter said, you know I love you. Then take care of my sheep, Jesus said. A third time, he asked him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt that Jesus asked the question a third time. He said, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said, then feed my sheep. Let's pray together this morning. Father, we pray that this story, some 2,000 years old, would come and breathe new life into our souls, into our hearts, our minds today, God. We pray that you'd speak to the very core of who we are, God. And I just, I pray specifically, if there's anyone here this weekend that, that's dealing with current failure in their relationship with you, anyone here this weekend that, that's de- dealing with past failure, that you would speak to their hearts today, God. May we understand, may we see a picture of you and what it's like to be restored and made new in our relationship with you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Well, when you think about failure, what's one of the very first things you think about? Not going to do that again, right? But most of us, if we fail at something, we give up and we don't want to do it again because we don't want to continue to fail. When we try something and we fail at it, we just think, nope, that's done, not going to try it again. Now, think about this part of the story and listen closely. It says, later Jesus appeared again to the disciples beside the Sea of Galilee. This is how it happened. Several of the disciples were there, Simon Peter, Thomas, Nathaniel, sons of Zebedee, the two other disciples. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. We'll come too, they all said. This is a really interesting detail and footnote in Scripture that they are at the Sea of Galilee, and Peter says, I'm going fishing. And now three years before, when Jesus had started his ministry, he's walking along the Sea of Galilee, and he sees a fisherman in a boat, who happens to be Simon Peter. And he says, hey, would you like to follow me? Would you like to learn how to fish for men? And and so Peter says, yes. And he begins this three-year experiment of following Jesus wherever he went, learning from Jesus about his teaching, trying to imitate those in his own life and, and begin to be like Jesus in his own life. But here we are three years later, a massive failure later. And where do we find Peter? exactly where Jesus found them in the first place, fishing in the Sea of Galilee. And now it seems like a little detail, but I think it's super fascinating because I think it works like that in our lives, that when we fail in our relationship with God, our tendency is to give up. Our tendency is to go back to what we knew, to go right back to where Jesus found us in the first place, to do the same things, to be in the same places with the same people that when he found us in the first place because we think we'll never be the people he thought we could be. And so we go fishing. For, for Peter, that dream, right? Hey, rock, you're going to be the future of my church. For Peter, that's all dead. He thinks, I failed. There's no way that's going to happen. It's all down the drain. And so he leaves it behind and he goes back to what he knew before and that was fishing in the Sea of Galilee. Over the years, I've had the opportunity to talk to a number of folks of all ages that have had amazing experiences with God. And these people would testify that God spoke to them and God called them to be something. And God invited and challenged them to a new way of life. But too frequently, what also is included in that story is some failure got them derailed, got them off track, and now they're just stuck. They're right back where God found them in the first place. And because of whatever failure they encountered, they've given up on what God spoke into their lives. They've let that go and they think that can never be me. And so they go back fishing. And they'll just stop for a minute and think, where, where did God find you? Did, did God find you money hungry and working for every dollar you can? Did, did God find you maybe addicted to something? Did, did God find you hungry for purpose and meaning in life? Where did God find you? And where are you today? 
Is, is it possible that some failure has dominated your life and you've gone back to where God found you and you, and you feel like you're stuck? You know, I, I've been in that same place. I'm sure you have. Where you think, how did I get back to this place? How did I get here? Because God had something for me. And, and how do I get back there? I don't know. And so we go back to what we knew. We go back to the things and places and people we knew. Failure leads us backwards, and it leads us to a place of being stuck. And it's a tough place to be, but thank God that we don't have to stay stuck. So, so the story continues, and, and there's just this one sentence that's fascinating. It says, at dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. Okay, so this is like a nerd alert moment, all right, for John Pickens. I, I feel closest to God when I think about God. And, and this one line, I just geek out on. Like I was sitting in my chair like, oh, this is such a profound insight. And so hopefully it makes sense to you today too. But, but I was thinking about this. At dawn, Jesus was standing on the beach, but the disciples couldn't see who he was. What does this mean, right? Well, I think one of the main things that means is that Jesus shows up in the middle of our failure. That, that God makes the first move. Peter jumps out of the boat. He responds, absolutely. But God is moving towards you in your failure. I think this is so hard for us to believe because we think maybe God is repulsed by us. Maybe God is repulsed by our sin or our failure, and he wants nothing to do with us. But the picture we see from the story is that he shows up in the middle of it, that he's standing right there in the middle of the failure. And here's what's more interesting. The disciples don't recognize Jesus. They have this whole conversation about fishing strategy of all things, right? Hey, have you caught any fish? No. What kind of lure are you using, right? And they go back and forth and back and forth, and they don't recognize him the entire time. I think this is also fascinating because in the midst of our failure, how many times has God shown up and we didn't even see him? Like, like we didn't even know he was there. But this faithful God that moves towards us even in the midst of our failure has been there calling us back to him. But we don't even see him. We don't even know it. We think that's not possible for God. But that is who God is. And that is who Jesus reveals God being to us. Not long ago, I had the opportunity to meet with a guy who was at a really tough place in his life. And this guy had been very successful. He had made a, a large amount of money. He was on a very uh, successful, prestigious career track. And he had a, a girlfriend and was living in the city and doing all these amazing things. And then he had this massive failure in his life. And so he lost his job. His girlfriend left him. And he was now without any money, and he was living back with his mother. And so we, we began to meet together. We agreed to read this book together called The Purpose Driven Life, right? And we'd, we'd get together and talk about the contents that were in the book. And he was a religious man, but the, the view that God had been presented to him when he was young was a harsh view of God, not a personal view of God. And so we're working through the book, and, and one day we get to the subject of failure. And, and I, I present to him this idea, is it possible that God is moving towards you right now? even in your failure, even before you really acknowledge him, that God has already moved towards you in that failure. And he said, I oh, mean, I don't know if that's possible for me to even believe that. That's, that's not the view of God that I grew up with. And I wonder how many of us are at that point. We're stuck. We're, we're right back to where God found us. We're out in this boat fishing, doing all that we know to do. And Jesus has shown up, and we're like, I don't... I don't know if it's possible that that's Jesus. I, I don't know that God could even move towards me in my failure. I, I think I'm probably relegated to this point. I, I just need to stay here. Now, we see something very different in the story, how Peter responds. You see, I think one of the temptations that we have is we think we need to pay God for our failure. Somehow we need to make it up to him. But what we see is beautiful in the ne this next part. This interaction between Jesus and Peter is fantastic. So, so they recognize it's Jesus on the shore, and Peter jumps out of the boat. I mean, nothing's going to hold him back. He's getting to Jesus. And so he responds to God's movement, and he moves towards God. And I imagine 
If I'm just imagining this and I'm standing there as one of the disciples, I imagine Peter is all wet and he runs up to Jesus and throws his arms around him and they embrace each other. The rest of the disciples get there. We're all celebrating. We sit down. We have, we have breakfast together. And it's a beautiful thing. And, and then all of a sudden, Jesus calls Peter over to have a, a private conversation with him. And if I'm one of the disciples, I'm thinking it's about to get real between Jesus and Peter, right? Like, Jesus knows Peter about the three denial thing, and he's going to lay the smack down. And that's what we almost expect. But, but just, just look at the story real quick. It says, after breakfast, Jesus asked Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Yes, Lord, Peter replied, you know I love you. Then feed my lambs, Jesus told him. Now, this happens two more times. The same thing. Jesus asks, do you love me? Peter says, yes. Then Jesus says, I've got work for you to do. Now, just think for a moment, what's not here? What's not here that we would expect here? Oh, we expect Peter to list out his sin. We expect Peter to be broken and to be weeping. And we expect Peter to maybe explain himself and to say how sorry he is and to maybe go on and on and on before Jesus but we don't have any of that. And in fact, I almost imagine that, that what happens here is Peter's trying to go down that road, right? Like I imagine Jesus calls Peter over and Peter's like, yeah, okay, I get it, right? This is the conversation. I need to come clean. And so they go over there and I imagine Peter tries to start. And he says, Jesus, about that, hey, Peter, do you love me? And Peter's like, well, yeah, I, I love you, but I need to talk to you about that. Feed my lambs, Peter. But, but Peter's like us. He's obsessed with, with describing this. And I imagine that this is in between the lines of Scripture. And Peter says, but, but Jesus, I really need to talk to you about that. Peter, do you, do you love me? And Peter's like, yes, I love you. But, but about that thing, I'm really sorry. Peter, feed my lambs. And then even a third time, that interchange happens again. Peter, do you love me? Yes, feed my lambs. And now some imagine that Jesus repeated it three different times because Peter denied him three times. And I think that's profound and I think that's probably true. But I also think Peter's got a super thick skull and I think you and I do too. And, and I think it probably takes three times or maybe even more for Jesus to say, I don't need you to recount all of that. I don't need you to beat yourself up. I know you're already broken. You've already responded to me by moving to me. And now let's move on, Peter. Do you love me? Yes. I've got work for you to do. It's almost as if we imagine that, that Jesus is saying, hey, Peter, we're good, man. We're, we're good. Like, like he's trying to convince Peter, we're okay. That, that whole rock thing, I still believe in that. That whole future of the church thing, I haven't given up in, on that. In fact, there's no, there's no plan B. Like we need to get back to work. And Jesus gives him something to do three times. Feed my lambs, feed my sheep, feed my lambs. Three times in a row, he has to get him moving because he is stuck in his failure. And so Jesus just asks one question. J just one question. It's almost like we don't even believe it. It's too simple. Jesus says, do you love me? That's it. Not confess all your sins, lay it out, I'm ready. He just says, do you love me? And Peter says, yes. And then Peter gets moving. Recently, um, I felt like God revealed to me a, a way that I had failed him in my own life. Uh, it was in this time of reflection and thinking about where I stood in my relationship with God and, and thinking about what that looked like. And I remember reflecting and thinking, how did I get here? I was right back in the old patterns, relying on myself, doing all the things I knew that I could do on my own, I was right back where I was before Jesus found me. And I remember being in that stuck place and thinking, man, I failed Jesus. And at that same point, this, this story was presented to me, and, and, and a teacher was presenting the story and saying, could you believe, could you believe that Jesus is moving towards you in the midst of your failure? Is that possible? And could you believe that it's as simple as loving him back? That you can't earn his forgiveness. That's what the New Testament's all about. That's what Jesus is all about. That he made a way for us that we couldn't make ourselves. Now, now could you believe 
that really your response to him is, yes, I do love you, and to get back to work, to get unstuck. And I said, well, I, I'm willing to give it a shot. And I wonder if here today, if there's some folks, maybe there's a recent failure in your relationship with God that's just got you hanging your head. You feel maybe that you are a failure, that you don't have any worth or purpose. What we see today is a God that meets us in our failure, that gives us purpose, and that says you are meaningful, you are important, you are not a failure. We need to get moving. But, but perhaps there's people here that failed a long time ago. And Jesus had something that he said to you a long time ago. There was some movement that you were making in your life. He had spoken some life into you. He had invited and challenged you to something greater. And because of that failure, maybe you've given up. And you're right back where Jesus found you, just hanging out in that boat, just waiting. And perhaps what you need to see today is that Jesus is standing right there on the shore. You can respond to him, and he's going to be standing there saying, do you love me? Let's get back to work. I've not given up on that. Let's pray together today. Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for these words 2,000 years ago. God, and we thank you that Peter jumped out of the boat, that we too can respond to you, that we can run to that shore, that we can restore our relationship with you. And so, Jesus, today we pray that, that if you're speaking to any person here at Crossbridge this weekend, that we would respond to you, that we would run to the shore, that we'd throw our arms around you and be open and honest about our love for you and get back to work because, God, the world needs it. The world needs us to get unstuck. You need us in your mission. We are valuable. We're a part of your plan. So, God, help us today as we respond to you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.